Hello, everyone. Welcome to our early career panel for the Spatial Data Science Symposium to 2023. Uh, I'm Dr. Vanessa Vassos. I am a lecturer in Spatial Data Science here at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And we have a lot of cool, interesting people here today to talk with us about prospects in terms of like career skills and other things that are relevant for someone at the early career stage. So I will ask our guests to introduce themselves. But... Kia ora, I'm Shrev. I'm also based here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And uh, yeah, similar to Gordon, I've had a bit of a mix of experiences. I started off, um, I've got a PhD in materials physics, but I got a bit disillusioned with academia, so I left and I got into data science um, and I worked at a tech startup in the UK. Um, and that was all about virtual fashion. And when I came back to New Zealand, I've been working mostly in public sector. So currently I'm a principal data analyst at Te Manatu Waka, which is the Ministry of Transport. Thanks, Sharif. So I, I appreciate the honesty there. <laughs> I, I got this. <laughs> yeah important to talk about those things as well as like we know statistically speaking you're more likely to work outside of academia and your skills are still very valuable for industry so really good to have yeah. you here uh fernando please yes thank you hello everyone my name is fernando benitez um i'm a lecturer in special data science at the university of st andrews uh previously i worked for the alan turin institute in in, in the UK as well. And I have some background also in the private sector. I work almost nearly a decade in S3. So I have some kind of background in the private sector and basically I have some thoughts about it. Yeah, Fernando has all sorts of experience. Uh, we did uh, one of our postdocs together. So there is a lot of industry stories, a lot of, you did an Erasmus masters as well. So a uh, lot of different countries. Okay, so I will start with our first uh, question here so that we can discuss. Um, so in your opinion, let's start with Sharif and then we rotate as the first opinion. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what are the top three skills or tools that you think an early career researcher should start developing in order to succeed or oh, uh, meaning skills that would be useful for helping them to succeed in this sector, spatial data science, geographic data science, considering your experience outside of academia, but also in academia. So not thinking just about an academic career per se. Yeah, so I'll mainly talk about skills that are a bit general um, because that's what I found to be the most useful. Certainly in the last uh, few years I've worked in public sector and I think would have been applicable even before when I was working in private sector. Um, and I think they're not just specific to spatial data science, um, but obviously going to be very helpful to people who are technical, uh, like geospatial data scientists. And the very first one is um, to develop a process for knowledge management. Um, I don't know if uh, that's something that's common in um, academia now, but uh, it's something that's been on my radar for a few years and I found it enormously beneficial to my day-to-day -day work um, as a technical data scientist, um, largely because I have to be across quite a lot of different domains um, all throughout the year, many different types of policy projects. And, you know, suddenly they're like, oh, you need to know all of this technical information. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, sorry, I shouldn't swear. But um, you, know, then you kind of have to manage um, your understanding and you need to have that available to you even in the future, right? Because they could be a lot of intense work at a short period of time, but actually it comes back later on. So that's been hugely helpful for me. Um, I think whatever works for people in terms of knowledge management, there's a bunch of different paradigms, but definitely develop that. Um, the second one is work management skills, especially those that emphasize deep work, which is this term that's coined by... Um, uh, an author called Cal Newport. And he, he really just says, you know, when you want to build your career capital, no matter what field you're in, um, you really need to spend a lot of time doing things and you need to have um, concentrated time in your day-to-day -day work time that you spend. Um, so you can't just be sort of flitting between different projects doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, and so I think that really, really helps when you're, 
in an environment where there is a lot of reactive um, aspects around you, people are asking you to do a hundred different things. And I think that's very common, no matter you're an academic, you're in private or public sector. But if you can't manage that and sort of silo yourself um, every day to do your deep work, you'll really struggle to, I think, build that career capital that you can kind of yeah. see accruing over time. Um, um, so yeah, I think... Yeah. If I may, because I just want to add something. I think that's quite interesting what you're saying, because it's basically yeah. how I feel mostly about the PhD process, that time that you have to focus on that thing that you're learning and build those, build that capital. So I think um, it's a good way to look at your PhD as well, beyond just a pathway to becoming an academic, but rather building your skills. But sorry, yeah. I just wanted to add that, please. No, I think that's a really great, um, great point. And, you know, looking back, I had a lot of that time during my PhD. But as soon as I left that, that wonderful phase of, um, of my academic life and went into the real world, so to speak, it was difficult to find time to do, you know, concentrated uh, work. So I think, yeah, people will find that no matter what field they're in I think um yes. <laughs> yeah yes. um so whatever works for you but just make sure you know you you sort of develop those skills that you have chunks of time that you're doing concentrated work and finally every project that you do um just find an element of technical upskilling um and I think that's one thing that's maybe more relevant in some areas than others again depending on where you work for me in the public sector working a lot by myself or on kind of um, sometimes very quick projects that you need to sort of deliver, it, you, you might find yourself going for a long period of time without actually having built any uh, technical skill. And as an early career researcher, it is really important for you to keep accruing those skills. So always find opportunities to add something in every project that you work with, negotiate it with your superiors, your colleagues. Um, but yeah, just make sure you get that going. Okay, thanks. I think I the next one I will ask a question is Fernando. But before we go back to the skills, there is a really cool question in the Q and A session, and I think Fernando would be really good to answer that because I know about many collaborations. So, um, Grant McKenzie is asking: Can you describe any collaborations or interdisciplinary work you have been involved in, how it has influenced your research career? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, that's a very great question, and, and I think it's quite related to what uh, the previous uh, panelist has mentioned. Um, I will say that my most interesting collaboration, I would say I have two. The first one is the work I did in St. Andrews. It was very interesting for me. It was my first postdoc experience. I had the chance to work with people from different background, but also trying to understand how other field works a little bit. I mean, in GIS science, especially in special data science, we tend to try to tackle different different like aspects of our topic. And then if you have experts from other fields trying to help you out with things you are not be like you're not going to be the expert is uh, extremely beneficial and 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 I had that experience in San Andreas in my first postdoc we have people from other institutes here in the UK helping us with a specific technical stuff but also uh, from other institutes so it, that that part was really uh, very important in that in that part of my career and and in another project I also was involved was in the Alan Turing Institute when you have other different type of backgrounds but also local or public sector, local authorities in, um, involved. So when you have the chance to hear uh, other uh, institutions and other like, like, I don't want to say like the real people or like the common people, basically people that not work in the academy, <laughs> in the academic sector. They have different ambitions, a different perspective of what you will need to, to deliver. So it's important that when you are thinking about the impact of your work, you can hear them out some of the questions and some of the needs that they have before entering into the new uh, research questions or the type of outcomes you wanted to create. And that experience was also super important. So if you have the way to work with uh, external stakeholders, public authorities, the general public, and try to enhance the type of impact that you have in your research or in your project, I think is super beneficial. And I had the chance to do it in, in both projects. I, I don't yeah. know if I'm replying the question properly or not, Grant, but I hope uh, I can give you some idea about it. 
Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I would probably answer it in a very uh, similar direction with all the collaborations. And by the way, in your case, it's quite interesting because your first postdoc was in San Andreas and now you're back at San Andreas as a lecturer. So yeah. there is this clear connection between your first postdoc going to Alan Turing <laughs> Institute, learning a lot, upskilling. And it was in the middle of the back. COVID. That was another challenge because my whole postdocs it was almost two years working through Zoom and Teams. So that was kind of like kind of frustrated, but also encourage us to work in the way that we have to actually collaborate, make ourselves the effort to create the calls. So yeah. it was quite challenging, but at the end, completely rewarded. And, and, and yes, it was a very enriched experience. I think one important thing to highlight that one of many important things that you said, but one that I would like to highlight is like, when you talk about expectations in terms of delivery, because we know that's very different between in academia and industry. Because I've worked with um, I've worked with like industry people like Strava, and when you say let's, for example, let's create a timeline for this project, mm -hmm. this that means completely different things in academia and in industry or like in the government, like the operational timeline is much shorter in industry and it's for now and it's not perfect. So I would add that like, it's really important to work on those time management skills as well. But yeah, anyway, uh, money and profit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You don't have all the time of in the universe to make it just the perfect project. It just needs to be good enough to be delivered in the industry. Sharif, uh, Sharif is agreeing with that. Yeah. I was just going to say one of the things that I found useful when I did work management um, practices at, um, in public sector is actually time tracking. So I time track every minute that I work. I mean, when I say every minute, I just start a timer and it has a, you know, it has a task or a project associated with it. And that's really helpful. Not that it's I'm judged on it, but for me to look back and understand how long things take, um, because like you say, some projects are very fast and yeah. you just have to know what you've done um, and how long you spent on it. And in my experience, it usually will take at least twice as much time as you think you will take because bugs will happen and other things. But you don't have uh, to be an expert on everything. Sometimes as an early career researcher, you have these big projects and ideas and you think you have to build everything. So I, I recall some experience of some PhD students trying to create like from the applications, then the project management, the social media campaigns, everything at the same time. If you can find colleagues that help you out with other kind of the tasks and you work together to achieve your project and just focus in the main part of your project, that will be highly beneficial. Uh, you don't have to be an expert of everything, but you really need to proper address the questions of your project you are you are leading. That's your main task. But sometimes these kind of main tasks with all the things you have to do, like get blurred out of the way and then you you are, are in troubles. Yeah, I uh, I would agree with that. It's important for early career research, trying to find the chances to present, lead a workshop, trying to make a tutorial, even if it's a short tutorial. If you have the chance to attend for any kind of conference, even if you don't have a paper or something to present, trying to find excuse with your supervisor or whatever like project you are involved to just jump into the pool and just trying to present something because communications skills are key also to present your yeah. ideas. So I just really like the, the point that Gordon made about the communication skills. So yeah, try to find those yeah. excuses to, to talk. <laughs> and I know that uh, for some people can be quite tough because a lot of the academics are actually introverts. But uh, as I can, if I could send a message of hope and joy, I would say I was a person that hated presentations. They made me shake and get really anxious and nervous. And through the three, four years of my PhD, I developed the presentation skills to a point that like, I just get a tiny bit nervous, but it's fine, I can do it. So there's hope, plus a special message if you're not a native speaker, because I'm clearly not with this accent, but you can understand me, I hope. Fernando is not a native speaker as well. None of us are native speakers here, actually, are we? I'm are you sure if Sharif is a native speaker? Yeah, sorry. 
the moment um, I say hello, you notice that. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> the same. But my point is, uh, the first time I gave a presentation in English, I actually memorized every single word, word because it was my first time living abroad. And I was like, if I forget anything, I don't have vocabulary to actually replace it. So all that to say that once you practice, it improves. Now I don't need to memorize words. So there is hope and it actually improves with training, as Fernando said. So go for all the presentations that you can, even if you don't like it. It's actually a very valuable skill. Um, I think I'll move on to our next question. And then after that, I will answer one of the questions in our chat. So this can is will I be add a something, yeah? Vanessa, just like mm -hmm. just to add the rest of the different skills. I will say, and this is more aligned to the special data science, but I would say, especially after my experience in the Alan Turing Institute, if you have the chance to learn how open science works and how version controls work and how you can like basically coordinate with other kind of your co-workers in the same project using the tools that we have at our disposals, it will be highly beneficial because because we tend to work only in our computer, only with our data, and we try to manage everything in ourselves. But if you have the chance to work in a team and try to work in the version control using Git and other kind of the tools, it will not all be it will not help be help you only with the special data science, also for other fields. And it's super beneficial for, for the early career researcher. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Even though I will confess that I am one of the people that need to work harder on that, I can do it, but I'm not <laughs> great at doing it. So that is a message for myself too. Uh, so, okay. So, what are the biggest mistakes you have made, or things you would do different in your career at all if you could go back? Let's. It's just different, a different ambition. It's like when you're working for the private sector, you have to wear a t-shirt of that company and the things they are promoting. And you need to be good at the technical level of that company or whatever project you are leading. If you are working for the public sector, you need to wear the t-shirt of the, of, the, uh, of the public and trying to understand what are their needs. So it's basically depending on the t-shirt you want to wear. If you are an academic and you are like facing a new PhD, sometimes people think that PhD is like the last step of your of your like your career but it's actually the first step is when you realize that you are completely ignorant and now you are <laughs> again in that way that oh my god i don't know anything about it even i've been working in the private sector for years but i'm completely ignorant in so many ways so it's basically for me it's, it's just another vision another way to prepare yourself for the things you are more passionate about it so in my personal experience after working for almost a decade in in s3 i I find uh, I found like a, a, um, some kind of expectations to create different stuff that I couldn't do it in the private sector, but also having the tools to guide or teach other kind of topics, like having like more broad perspective that I was having in one of those uh, those type of companies. But it doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't mean that I was not quite happy over there. I was actually like trying to create different solutions for other type of organizations, but I want to focus more in my personal uh, perspective and, and, and preparations for doing all this stuff. But at, at the end, it's, it's a total valid point. And, and for me, it's, it's depending. I'm, you're going to realize some years after you finish your PhD if it's still the right path for you, not in the first year of your PhD. It's still a struggle. I think uh, that links directly with a comment that Christoph posted that, like, but it's valid for the ind industry, a good measure of success. And um, I will start with my opinion, then I will open to you. I think in order to decide val if valid for industry is a good measure of success, you need to first define your own, what you mean by success, because being successful probably means different things for, in for all of us here. Like for me, maybe means having a good work-life balance and not working 50 hours per week. Let's start oh. with Shirev. How do you yes. feel about it's valid for industry, a good measure of success? Uh, I find that really hard to answer, actually, because um, yeah. as an academic, I used to always have to justify my research in the introduction <laughs> that it's relevant outside of academia. Um, yep. And now in the public sector, um, I don't do the same thing anymore because everything I do is 
you know, somehow connect it to real world outcomes, though in very tenuous ways, especially when you're a data scientist, it's not necessarily that what you're doing is going to immediately reach people. And and I should emphasize the ministry I work for doesn't have any operational um, responsibilities for a predominantly public policy. So what you do is, so, you know, very, there's a long chain between you yeah. and the and the real world outcome. But I think what I find very, um, I'm very satisfied with now, and, I, and again, it might change in the next month and the next year, but I really like it when I can provide people insight and value that they, perspectives that they didn't have before. Um, and this is where I think as a data scientist, you can really make some real impact, not ex- not like, you know, you increase the ROI of some project or, you know, you have some very, very sort of clear impact, but that you're actually influencing people to change their perspectives and therefore do their work with a bit more nuance, maybe with a different idea than they had before. And you've by the way, good- ROI is return of investment right return of investment yes. yes that is correct yeah it's you know classic oh i put x amount of money in whether it's people whether it's whatnot and then this is how much i get back in terms of profits yeah. um but that's from a company perspective but you know you have yeah. equivalents out everywhere um yeah so that's currently what i feel very satisfied by and is i feel successful so that would be yes exactly that's what i would say your measure of success would be like i'm doing i'm i'm getting paid it's a job but i'm doing something that brings meaning and impact so yes. yeah yeah i think that's a yeah i think we share a similar view in like you need to define what is success to then see whether valid for industry is a good enough measure to do a phd um you don't necessarily need to do a phd to work for industry but there are other reasons for you to do a phd i have a student now that works with me that's doing a phd she wants to work for industry she knows that already but she's doing a phd because she feels a personal sense of achievement that's her goal and like it was quite interesting because when i was interviewing her i was like i'm not sure because like you want to do it for personal achievement i'd really like because after going for the phd and i always wanted to become an academic since i started mine i was like uh, I'm not sure if that will be enough to get you through the really tough times that you have during the PhD, but she's actually great. She has a, it's a true motivation for her to do that because she's passionate about the topic and she feels motivated. So different people have different measures of success and motivation, I would say. Fernando? And yes, yeah, sometimes also in the industry, you have to do research. So depending on your role, you have the opportunity to dig into the specific topics, sometimes using a specific platform. But in most of the cases, depending on your role in that industry, you, have to, you, you also have to do research. You have to be consistent, systematic, trying to understand all the, the process. Maybe what is missing over there is they don't really care about the method. They don't really care about the, the paper outcome. You really need to find a solution that is pro- like that, that, that they're requesting and they are going to give you a specific deadline, um, most likely using the platform from that industry, obviously. Uh, but then at the end, you have to take time for understanding how you're going to provide that solution. So for that, you have to do some kind of research. And at the end, you present in, in, in maybe sometimes in a, in, a, in, a, in a team that type of solution. But it doesn't mean you don't have to do some kind of uh, uh, research sometimes you have to do it and i know a lot of people working in different uh, institutions sometimes in specific research institutions that they they are really enjoying the power of doing this research even though they are considered part of the industry yeah i think that's a good point and that just made me think of like um I think one of the key outcomes, at least for me, and I would like you to share yours as well, uh, for my PhD working with data science and and other things was like the time that I had to develop the data science skills and the analysis, but also I learned how I learn, if that makes sense. I don't know if you feel the same, like you learn how you learn and then it becomes quicker to learn new things. And that's really valuable in any role that you could possibly have. We have another really cool question here at, at the Q&A. So uh, I think it's Luisa Lucchesi is asking, any of you are from interdisciplinary backgrounds? If so, how was the tra- transition to working with spatial data science? Um, Fernando, you haven't started anyone, so. <laughs> 
Well, I'm an engineer. I'm a cadastral and geodesy engineer. So the geodesy is the study of the gravitational force and the shape that the Earth has and, and the mathematical background of that. And then I moved through like my work in ESRI to get passionate about the special data. Uh, but I have been working with the special data since I started my, in, my, my, my bachelor degree. And so most, most, most of the interdisciplinary uh, like skills and experience I have, I did it when I started the PhD. Because before that, because I was working in, in this kind of geospatial sector, I was basically talking with the same language with everyone, including some of the public authorities we were um, uh, consulting. So it was kind of like difficult for me to reply to this question. But then when I was working in, 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 in St. Andrews, we have to deal with biologist people, for people like experts in geomagnetic field, then in the 2D working with really skilled computer science people that I can develop a program in half an hour and it took me for me three weeks to do it and most likely like in a bad way. And it was really a shock trying to see how different skills need to be combined in one table and try to see what is your main contribution. What is the contribution of the special data scientist in this kind of diverse table? So was one of the main challenge. And I will say that most of the early career researchers and maybe other other academics, they struggle at the same time. Uh, but at the end, once you understand the different contribution of the different other type of backgrounds, you can actually provide uh, your valuable uh, contribution using the spatial data, even if it's a, um, um, analysis or sometimes it's some kind of integration of the data, sometimes also the structure of how the GIA science is going to help you with the project. But it's Sometimes it's slightly, uh, sometimes no, usually it's very challenging. Yeah. I agree, second that. Sharif, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think a very slightly different um, perspective, just again, given the, the background um, difference between myself and Fernando, but I find that um, spatial What's data science. background? Tell well, people, physics, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I went from materials physics, so I used to run uh, a lot of experiments on um, nanomaterials, so spectroscopy, uh, low temperature conductivity measurements to characterize them um, in the hope that they could be used in industry. Um, and uh, then I, once I finished my PhD, I got into data science and I worked for a tech startup in the UK and they had a solution to help people buy better fitting clothes. So there was a, a virtual fitting room. And so I worked a lot with customer data science uh, over there. Um, and then when I came back to New Zealand, I've mainly been working in public sector, um, predominantly at Ministry of Transport. Um, so that's, that's the sort of background. And I really only got into spatial data science uh, back in New Zealand. I sort of worked very loosely with spatial data before, but not really, uh, it was not a day-to-day -day thing as a data scientist. Um, but um, one thing I wanted to just mention is I think spatial data science is so varied um, and that's what I really find quite awesome about it. So I have personal interests in um, urbanism, but I work, you know, just on that sort of transport part of it um, in the ministry and largely around supply chain and freight. And those are two quite different aspects, which are, you know, where you can generate a lot of insight with spatial, uh, with spatial data science, but actually the techniques don't necessarily correspond. So I find that really valuable and, what really appeals to me with um, data science in general, and of course, spatial data science as well, is you build these skills and you can use them in vastly different domains. So it's by its nature kind of interdisciplinary. So you, you might start off as an urban uh, spatial data scientist, but you might go get into um, transport and, um, you know, freight movements or um, animal migrations like, you know, and I know that there's background people with those backgrounds here. So um, that's that's yeah, my perspective. Yeah, I think one really good thing that you, 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 important that you said is like there is this. I usually when I give my introduction to spatial data science class, I have this Venn diagram where I have the domain knowledge, uh, geography, and computer science, and then like spatial data science is at the intersection of all these things, and the domain knowledge will vary according to um, what you are specifically studying what are you applying 
applying data science to, and actually I also have the statistics as another <laughs> sphere there. Um, sure, so if I have the... a question, okay. sorry for that. I just have a question specifically for you because you came from physics and I often teach students from computer science, from engineering as well. And I want to see if my perception will match yours on that. What was the most difficult thing or what was really unexpected when you worked you started working with spatial data that you like you were not aware of because we know that spatial data has its own part like specificities and particulars so did you have anything that you were like oh i need to learn about this because i had no idea because like i've been dealing with data but for spatial data this is very different or it was all like super straightforward for you some parts were relatively straightforward, and I think this is the power of um, the FOSS, so the free and open source software paradigms that most people tend to use. So you cover yeah. from Python or R, and you do data science, it's pretty easy for you to get into spatial data science, um, at least technical aspects of it. Um, I think some of the geography um, components were <laughs> were um, were challenging, and I still yeah. and I still have to get my head around it. Um, and I, I do find it interesting that a lot of geographers think quite differently about spatial problems to a spatial data scientist. You know, uh, we go to some of these conferences, there are a lot of people with geography backgrounds and it's fascinating. You know, they look at this problem like, oh, I would do it this way. And they've done it something quite different. And it's both valuable, but also quite, you know, it, it sort of makes you think, you know, what are the what are the benefits of all these vastly different approaches to look at, you know, a particular set of problems? Um, so, yeah, I find the geography aspects something that I still need to keep learning because that's absolutely not in my background at all. So. Yeah, that's the perception I have with my students from computer science and engineering. One of the first things that they really struggle with is understanding coordinate reference systems, yeah. which if you have taken any GIS course or if you have been in geography for you, it's like, can do it during my sleep, super easy, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, so the geographic aspects, I think, are often challenged if you're coming from data science for spatial. I think it's the main difference. Fernando, I think you wanted to add something. Oh, yes, it's just about, um, just to echo the engineer's side, sometimes if you're academic, this, this background that taught you about being systematic and you're trying to understand everything in terms of GRs and how they are connected, even if you are geodesic or cadastral engineer, you have this kind of systematic way of thinking. But sometimes in academic, you need to think about in other kind of outside of the box and instead to think about the different gears or different puzzles, you need to think about the method. Sometimes that part could be a little bit challenging as well because you try Trying to translate everything in input and outputs and sometimes of like modeling in between but when you are working at academic you need to think about in the term in terms of like the generic model or the types of uh, method that you are going to present so sometimes that part is also a slightly challenging but i just wanted to echo what uh, travia said <laughs> about how she she can just easily or oh, or any kind of resources can easily uh, use the power of spatial data to work even with a specific tool or a specific method that I, that I think is super, super flexible from uh, the topic we are working on and, and the field we are working on. Thanks. Uh, there, uh, there is a question here that actually is very similar to one that I had. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me find it here. So I I was going to ask you, like, how did you decide between an academic slash non-academic career, which I still want to ask, but I will add something on top of that, because someone on the chat just asked, uh, to those that successfully transitioned into tenure or tenure track academic roles, what are some good advice you could give us postdocs? So I think Fernando and I can give maybe, hopefully, some useful advice, but I would like to ask you all... Um, I think, like I said, I got disillusioned with academia quite deeply. Um, I'm a really big fan of transparent and open science, something that Fernando mentioned earlier. And um, I was certainly not seeing a lot of that. I think it's increasing now in academia and certainly in um, some fields. There's a lot of that. But in the physics world that I was in, um, it was not popular. 
<laughs> um, and I, I found myself quite frustrated because I strongly feel that science should be open, very transparent all the way through the pipeline, right from what PhD students do through to the papers you publish, um, through to even communicating it in a way to, you know, the public that's actually funding your research. Um, and so that was one big thing. I didn't really like the operation of academia, how it how it worked, the the challenges of finding like a secure job, obviously, as well. Like, you know, you always have this big uncertainty. Um, when will mm -hmm. you get your tenure position? How often can, I mean, you know, and some people like it and that's totally fine, but I think many people do want a little bit more sort of stability um, so that they can have a good routine, um, other things in their life. Um, but I think the, other than that, the biggest consideration for me was I really like being able to switch domains um, from virtual fashion to um, public, you know, sector data science and transport and maybe urbanism and things like that in, in another career path that I might do in the next few years or something totally different, I don't know. But I had that opportunity to be quite um, flexible in terms of what domain I work in and what aspect of that domain. So I enjoy the sort of more academic -y things, which is what I'm doing right now, which is writing my analyses, um, not like an academic would, but I do do a lot of methods write up and I do talk about, I do present my findings. Um, but I also enjoy the software side of things like Gordon mentioned, I, I have to, a large part of my work is automation and making sure data pipelines in the ministry are robust and sensible. Um, and I have that, I have that really big sort of variety in my role that I really enjoy. Um, yeah. and I can still go home at the end of the day and I not worry still. about <laughs> some crazy deadline <laughs> that I have to do for some, somebody that I may not care that much about, um, it, which does tend to happen in academia. So, yeah. Okay. Fernando, you go before I give my view on <laughs> Well, I will say that in my personal case, there were like two, two important, uh, like, uh, yeah, parts of my life when I decided to keep working in the academic uh, life. So first one was during my PhD. I was in the second year. I was struggling a lot with my first paper. I wasn't really happy with that. So I was like hesitated. Should I stay here? I think I made a huge mistake. Just remember that I came from the private sector. I was actually earning a little bit more money over there. But it wasn't like my dream to study abroad in Europe. And I was trying my best to pursue that part. And I signed up for a winter PhD school in a community called Agile. Most of you guys maybe are familiar with Agile, uh, that Agile conference. So I went to this winter uh, PhD school and I met one of my mentors. Maybe he doesn't know that he's one of my mentors, but I remember distinctly that he told us how the academic world is Alex, or Professor Alex Comber in the University of Leeds. Mm. And I really yeah. liked the way he was encouraging other PhD students in that PhD uh, winter school. So he was taking a specific topic. He prepared the topic. He basically present for me, one of the best way to 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 teach or, or like to guide some of these topics he was working over there. So I started to like the way that he was teaching. Uh, the other part was the networking after the PhD uh, school. And when you are an academic, you have the opportunity to meet other kind of students or the type of professors, and then you visit other universities. And I started to really like the way that we can travel and we have this flexibility, even though we have this tremendous pressure to make our paper. For me, the flexibility on being an academic was kind of one of the most appealing points. And, uh, and then I realized that, okay, this is one of the things I would like to do uh, for, for my future. And the second one, the second pivot point, I would say, is when I had the chance to work in the University of St. Andrews and I had the chance to work in you know, a tool that actually I create from scratch. So it was, again, another remarkable opportunity. One of my mentors, uh, Professor Urska Demsa, she had this amazing idea. I was also working with Vanessa and we came together and the idea was, oh, this is super cool, but we have no idea how to do it. And then we have several like meetings uh, drawing things in the in 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 the in the wall in the in, in in some of the notes and try to come up with some kind of solution and after one year and a half we come up with this cool tool that for me right now is one of my biggest prouds so it was it was really fantastic as soon as we finished the paper it was outside we could actually promote the tool. And for me, even though you have the chance in the private sector 
work to obviously create a project, like present different insights. But sometimes, at least in my experience, I didn't have the chance to create a tool from the scratch. From the very beginning, something nobody has created. And I had the chance in, in, in my first postdoc, and I'm still proud about it. Obviously, the tool maybe could be developed in a more better way because I'm not a computer science and not developer per se. So most likely, if you go to our report, you're going to find tons of different <laughs> errors. But I don't, I don't mind really. I, for me, the most important part was the method and all the process. Something that I think Vanessa already mentioned. So for me, these two points helped me out to decide, stick to it, academia, and now become a lecturer. It sounds like you like the creative freedom. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. I think just as a quick contribution, I think I went to like my decision making was a bit different because I was. I think quite pragmatic, if I'm being honest. I did a Bachelor of uh, Science in Geography in Brazil. And basically, I knew that to have a salary that would pay enough to keep my family at good standards in Brazil, I needed to have a job and with a geography degree. There were very few options that would give me that in Brazil because I didn't want to be a school teacher. So I just decided one day in my second year that I wanted to be a university professor because they make a lot of money. So I thought <laughs> when I was an undergrad <laughs> in Brazil, it's a really good salary considering all the options. So that's why I started with the decision. But then as I moved toward that goal, which meant I started doing internships and doing everything I could to get into a good master program, which was a really good one in Brazil. Um, I actually discovered that I really liked learning and learning new things on the way. And then I did a master degree in remote sensing, got a PhD in Scotland. And by that point, I already knew I wanted to become an academic, like since my undergrad. And basically, I created this plan and just went along with it. However, once I finished my PhD, uh, I had this goal that was like I will give myself three years and that was a personal choice I'll give myself three years if I don't get a permanent position I'm going for industry because that was my personal limit for like that's how long I can deal with the instability of not having a permanent job and having to move because I'm a person that really likes stay like being stable having like a place to call mine So I think it's important to negotiate with yourself and see where you are willing to actually negotiate and what you can't not in order to decide as well if you want an academic or non-academic career. And in terms of like successfully transition, I would say that what really helped me was doing beyond the PhD stuff. So I was always doing some tiny, small projects and that's how I got my first and second postdoc, they were basically side projects during the PhD and they became full projects. Anyway, well, um, I think this has been really good participation. We still have questions that we haven't answered, but we don't have much time. So what I would like to do now is to get from you three uh, a final message to our early career researchers that are here. So something that you you hoped someone had said to you before when you were an ECR? Uh, Fernando? Uh, I would say I have just, I have just two advice, uh, just final comments. Uh, the first one is don't overstress yourself too much. Things will work out eventually. Just be consistent, disciplined with the things you like, but don't overreact for whatever, even if you supervise or insist in something. Just relax, take your time, look after your mental health, for, go for a walk, and try to think about the things you are wanting to finish. Um, I know that sometimes when you are doing a PhD or you're working a postdoc, you have a limited time, but things will work out eventually. So just take it easy, uh, look after your mental health, as I said. And once you look after your mental health, you're going to have a clear mind to understand or trying to sort it out all the things that 
sometimes you are you are a struggle at. And the other advice, and kind of related to the previous one, is trying to stick to the topic you are passionate about it. Especially now, now we have so many techniques, so many tools. Now we have ChatGPT, that we have uh, a new uh, natural language modules. Now we have different open data sources. Now we have like a lot of things that obviously all the time are like confusing. And sometimes we, we think, oh, maybe we need to change the topic. But if you are passionate about biology, special data, Data, data fusions, whatever topic you are passionate about, stick to that topic because if you are passionate about this topic, it's going to keep you consistent and most likely one of the best researchers in that topic. So even though you have plenty of different distractions, try to avoid that and stick to the things that you are more passionate about it. Thanks. I think that's good advice. Sharif? I just wanted to echo something uh, Gordon mentioned, and um, but with the perspective of um, intention, I think on as as an early career researcher. So data science and spatial data science, it has all these different components, right? It's got the the methodology, it's got the the geography, it's got um, machine learning potentially, or you know artificial intelligence aspects, um, software carpentry, um, package development. Um, I think you know to be a um, a person with flexible options in the future, think about what of those things you want to focus on um, and, and, you know, just strategically develop your skills and don't freak out and stress if you're slow, like Fernando mentioned, just keep accruing them. But, you know, if you have that intent, you have a clarity going forward. Um, if you choose not to worry about software carpentry, that's fine. Maybe do something else that's kind of related, right? Maybe data processing, data pipelines. Um, because I think yeah, that will give you a ton of flexibility to go whichever direction you want to go um, once you firm up um, in the future and you have these skills to rely on. Yeah. Well, I would just like to say big thanks to you, Fernando, Gordon, and Cherie for being here with me. Thank you very much to the organizing committee for inviting me. It has been a great pleasure.